following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio, streaming, and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for navigating the madness of mental health using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This week, we're asking, am I a narcissist? Is that rotten person who's mean to me a narcissist? Is my mother a narcissist? Are all the people around me narcissists? Too long, didn't read. You'll probably never know for sure. But if you think they might be, assume they are and behave accordingly. My guest this week is Jeremy Sherman, author of Psychology Today's Jerkology blog and the book What's Up With A-Holes, How to Spot and Stop Them Without Becoming One. Jeremy will be joining us later to talk about narcissistic thought processes and superhero fiction. That's going to be great, even if that one is going to hit close to home. Narcissism especially in reference to narcissistic abuse, has become an overused buzzword often thrown at people by actual narcissists trying to deflect blame and cover their tracks. Narcissism is also glorified and rewarded in politics, the media, and business. Never admit you're wrong, blame the other guy, backstab, and only care about yourself. Seek revenge whenever possible. These are action movie tropes, right? And some experiences I've had with people in academia. Narcissism is everywhere. But what actually is narcissism? How do we know if someone is a narcissist? Narcissism can be, but isn't always, a personality disorder. And someone can be self-absorbed on a particular issue without being a narcissist. We all have moments where we're blind to the suffering of others because we're so wounded that we're intensely focused only on ourselves. But for most of us, that's not a constant or most common state. Most people do have empathy that they use. So what is narcissism? Colloquially, narcissism is defined as an excessive preoccupation with oneself and one's own needs, often at the expense of others. And it's at the expense of others, that part, that's the problem, that's true. But this definitional focus on meeting one's own needs, no, no, that's wrong. You should focus on your own needs. Adults are responsible for meeting their own needs. A narcissist goes beyond actual needs. Every whim and want they have pe becomes a perceived need, not just a want. And they expect the people around them to deliver those needs to them instead of them taking responsibility for getting it themselves. It's okay to want things. I want to make this extremely clear. It's okay to want things. And if you truly like yourself, you don't have to step on other people to get the things that you want. In fact, healthy self-esteem is the counter for narcissism. If you have healthy self-esteem, you can hear reasonable criticism, take responsibility for mistakes and the things you do right, and make the necessary corrections. Top 10 phrase, self-esteem cannot exist without self-compassion. It's that self-compassion that textbook narcissists lack. They don't have compassion in general, so they don't have healthy self-esteem. Beneath the narcissist's puffery, they have an unstable sense of self-worth. That's the problem. That's why they have tantrums and don't consider other people. Now, there's a lot of things that, you know, behaviors that appear narcissistic that people do who aren't narcissists. It is possible to pick up narcissistic behaviors if you were raised by a narcissist or you work with a lot of narcissists without actually being a narcissist because you start believing that this unhealthy behavior is normal. And because there are different kinds of narcissists, it can be really hard to spot one. Never mind, be sure you're dealing with one. Like I said, if in doubt, assume and act accordingly. 
Narcissistic personality disorder, on the other hand, the actual disorder has criteria that can be helpful in narrowing it down. Again, I don't want to scare anyone. Only having a couple of these markers, checking a couple of these boxes, that doesn't mean you have narcissistic personality disorder. You have to have five or more of these nine criteria to be diagnosed. Please don't self-diagnose, especially not with personality disorders, okay? Here are the things to watch for. A grandiose sense of self-importance, not just any sense of self-importance, a grandiose one, one that's unreasonably big. A preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Not some power, some brilliance, wanting people to think you're beautiful or, you know, we all want to be loved and cared about. Unlimited ideal, preoccupation. These are important keywords. A belief that they're special and unique and can only be understood by or should, should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. That's the one where a lot of people act like narcissists because of the hustle, right? That alone doesn't make you a narcissist. A need for excessive admiration. A sense of entitlement. Interpersonally exploitative behavior. What does that mean? It means you use and manipulate people. A lack of empathy. Envy of others or a belief that others are envious of them. Again, no single one of these means you're a narcissist. You need five or more to be diagnosed with a personality disorder. And the last one is a demonstration of arrogant and haughty behaviors or attitudes. Haughty. I got to use the word haughty. Haughty is a very haughty word. It's ironic that way. Yeah, those last two, you know, envy or a belief that people are envious of them. Uh, you know, a demonstration of arrogant or haughty behaviors or attitudes. Like, we all do that sometimes, right? We all do the, oh, they're just jealous. In my case... It's true. Sometimes there are people that are jealous of my place in the media. <laughs> Being jealous of someone in Canadian media that seek help. <laughs> the, the point is, like I said, don't self-diagnose. What therapists look for with narcissistic personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of grandiosity, a constant need for admiration, an ongoing lack of empathy, and it usually begins by early adulthood. And this is the thing with personality disorders. They present in a variety of contexts. It's not a single thing that triggers someone. It's in a variety of contexts. The the persistence is one of those things that that makes narcissistic personality disorder different than say some something like borderline personality disorder where people can you know hide it in public but then they fall apart in private sometimes right this is why you need a professional this is why this show is called it's not therapy your friend's belief that he's a better singer than he really is doesn't qualify as narcissism okay you're you're Buddy's belief that they're going to play for the NBA, even though they're not good enough. That's not narcissism. That's just b b having a dream, <laughs> right? Like, it's not that. And despite the fact that people just hang the label narcissist on people for only one of these things, when it takes more than one, it gets even more complicated because narcissism doesn't just present in the traditional grandiose way. There's also this thing called vulnerable or covert narcissism. Yes, Taylor Swift mentions she might be a covert narcissist in the song Antihero. Swift drop, there we go, yeah. Okay, so grandiose narcissist. That's what most people think when they think of narcissism, right? 
grandiose narcissists display this intense but fragile outward confidence. They're exhibitionists. They're manipulative. They're antagonistic. They have this focus on social dominance, reward seeking, and risk taking. They can be charming in the short term and sound very authoritative and self promoting, which is why they tend to get ahead in the short to medium term. On the other hand, we've got those vulnerable narcissists, the covert narcissists. They're shy. Yes, they're shy. What? A narcissist is shy? Yep. They're also vindictive and needy. The challenge with covert narcissism is that covert or vulnerable narcissism can look like a lot of other things. Covert narcissists can be grade A people pleasers, but their people pleasing is a selfish manipulation designed to use the other person, not a survival tactic like it is in trauma cases, borderline personality disorder, or a bunch of other conditions. Some people people please just out of anxiety. A covert narcissist's unstable and unclear sense of self leads them to resent the success of others. This is where we come back into familiar narcissist territory. That's why it's a narcissist. They're not just shy. They feel deep shame deep down that they may not even admit to themselves. And they distrust others' intentions. Now, your trust issues alone do not make you a covert narcissist, okay? There are other things. Covert narcissists aren't just jealous. They're needy. Okay? Jealous and needy. They're obsessive. They have an excessive need for admiration, approval, and support that will eventually wear out the few friends that they do make. And when those friends set boundaries or drop them, vulnerable narcissists tend to get vengeful. And you're probably pretty freaked out right now because it's like, this could describe so many people I know. Don't worry. True narcissistic personality disorder is fairly rare. That doesn't mean you don't know one, but, you know, it's fairly rare. My guest this week also has strategies to determine if you're being narcissistic and how to deal with narcissists around you. Jeremy Sherman, self-described psychoproctologist, will join us after the break. Questions, comments, concerns, Leanna at nottherapyshow.com. Go to the website, fill out the contact form at nottherapyshow.com. Join our mailing list while you're there or social media. The land where the narcissists play at Not Therapy Show on X, that's Twitter, Instagram, and threads. We'll be back with Jeremy Sherman talking how to deal with narcissists, how to spot a narcissist, how do people become narcissists after this on It's Not Therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back in the Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist, and we're still talking narcissism. And as promised, I have a guest who is an expert on jerkology. Jerkology is the name of one of Jeremy E. Sherman's blogs on psychology today. He's got a blog called Jerkology. He's got a blog called Ambigamy. Jer- Jeremy has a PhD in evolutionary decision theory, and he wrote an article about how people become narcissist. Jeremy, welcome to It's Not Therapy. It's great to be here. Okay, so standard operating procedure is we don't know what causes narcissism, but there there are some precursors. Now, you've made a very interesting chain of events in your article that focuses on something we all do to an extent. Um, The um, self-reassuring escapism, correct? Yes. Now, what is self-reassuring escapism? Well, uh, it's 
Uh, so my background, I, I do an interesting combination of work. I call it my middle age spread. I do origins of life research and um, and I study what makes humans so radically different, which includes language. Uh, it's largely about language. Um, and uh, and it goes all the way. So I call it cradle to grave from the origins of life to our grave situation, which I think of as primarily about narcissism or its equivalents. Um uh, humans are an uncommonly anxious species. With mm -hmm. language, we are trudging through a sandstorm of mojo eroding possibilities. We can imagine the past, the future, real and imaginary threats and missed opportunities. Um, it wears at our mojo. So um, I am very interested in the power of safe escapism, optimal illusion, strategic gullibility, how to kid ourselves in ways that reassure us and give us comfort, um, but aren't dangerous. So I would, so we all take these, you could say, mojo replenishing pit stops, and we take them in all sorts of forms: the, uh, shopping therapy, masturbation, uh, going to church, uh, um, watching movies, and identifying with heroes. These are all ways in which we can, and there are many, many more. It, you know, going to a, a rally, you know, or 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 claiming to believe in some ideology that makes it sound like you've solved the world, mm -hmm. uh, makes you feel like you're a genius. I, I think we need that stuff. But um, I say self-love is important, but get a room and don't let it go to your head. <laughs> Um, and so I'm very interested in how to keep from doing that. And yes, yeah, so I, I think that humans just fundamentally have a chip on our shoulders. We're a little bit like hummingbirds who need ne nectar, every, nectar every 15 minutes. We need some kind of no mojo reassurance. And if we don't get it from the outside, we'll, we'll often talk ourselves up, give ourselves pep talk um, to, to feel good about ourselves. Because with language, we can imagine the ideal um, see where we fall short, mm -hmm. and then self-idealize. Mm -hmm. That's where the danger comes in. Right, because a little is good, or a moderate amount is good, but too much, and you know, you hit a point of no return, and you lose the grasp on reality. That's uh, right. So yeah, yeah for, for me, it's not how far out you go, or even how long you go out, as long as you remember to come back. So we need to take our flights of fancy, but always with a return ticket to reality secure in our heart pockets. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I love superheroes. So you're speaking my language. Like I'm yeah, vaguely, yeah. yeah, I'm vaguely obsessed. But it is true that I spend a lot of time going, okay, I want to take the right lessons from this, not the possibly not so great ones. And there are a lot of superheroes, um, you know, Tony Stark, Iron Man, comes to mind he's got some real narcissistic tendencies and as you said in your article he's so rich that reality doesn't apply he can just make stuff right. up he can he can torque reality around him you know the the proverbial reality distortion field that they talk about he can do that and not have the consequences that somebody with less money say you know a spider-man yeah. peter parker could now again wealth is great success is wonderful how how do you find the balance because obviously a lot of this stuff is really subjective it's it's really subjective and you're on to a fascinating point they say that isis members identify with hollywood uh superheroes the white hat superheroes that is we leave it up to audiences to, to decide what to identify with and what not to identify with, which leads to a tongue twister um, question, pair of questions that I ask my students. One is, is virtual virtue a virtue or a vice? Mm -hmm. That is identifying with superheroes. Um, it's, a, it's a virtue as long as, uh, oh, a, a, identifying with white hat heroes. Um, it's a virtue as long as you um, you act that way in the world. It, mm -hmm. You know, it it, be, it it motivates you. It's a vice if it's instead of acting that way. It's like leaving the theater after seeing Hotel Rwanda and saying, "No, I'm not giving any money." But yeah, I just gave in the theater. Yeah, it, it, it's a major okay. issue in theology. You know, it, it's called frequent communion. Uh, the other question is: Is virtual vice a virtue or a vice? And it's the opposite. That is, we want virtual vice. 
um, to be a substitute for behavior in the outside world. Go ahead and play your violent video games, but just don't do that. Uh, you know, get a room. Don't do that out right. in the real world. Right. So, and we leave it up to audiences to decide. Um, to me, it all comes down to whether you come back to reality. So I've been to Trump rallies and I've been to death metal concerts. And from my perspective, they're all great, healthy fun. It's cosplay. You dress yourself up, mm -hmm. the lifestyle brand. You chant the badass lyrics. You're not paying attention to what they mean. You just feel like a badass for saying them. <laughs> the only difference, the only difference is what happens in the parking lot after. Right. After, after the death metal a concert people zip up and get back to reality um after uh, after the dangerous forms it's got nothing to do with a uh, political perspective it can be done in any lifestyle brand you know to me there's no difference between let's say a communist rally or or a or a right wing rally the difference that matters to me is whether you come out of there get back to reality or whether you come out of there thinking you've just experienced something more real than reality that's where it gets dangerous. Man, you're hitting all my favorite things here, Jeremy. <laughs> Violent <laughs> video games, the death metal. Uh, <laughs> I get updates on Sabaton videos. So, and I mean, there's a shining example of one where people would hear, I like that band. They do music based on historical military battles. And some of their songs are done from the point of view of the Nazis. And so right. some people, yeah. yeah, some people associate that with, oh, there must be something wrong with you. It's like, no, I can separate the the temporary fiction of the song, the, the perspective taking. I can do that and not lose myself in it. And I do see people who like the same things as I do, you know, yeah. because I navigate those spaces. The reason I play you know, Elden Ring or Grand Theft Auto is not going to be the same as the reason somebody else does. And how can you tell if your gaming habits are just me blowing off steam and Doom Eternal, the epicenter of both metal music and violent video games, or there's, there's something wrong. There's something that somebody should pay attention to, notably parents? It's a great question. Yeah. It, it, it's a great question. And one of the answers is you can't take their word for it. So someone right. can say, look, I know the difference, but it, it it's happening at a very unconscious level. Um, the article you mentioned is actually an interesting one for me to have written because I'm paying a whole lot of attention to, you could say, deficit and surplus uh, mm -hmm. paths to narcissism. That article was about a deficit. That is, if you've got a chip on your shoulder, um, at some point you might start to imagine a world where all of your mistakes are actually heroic. Um, and it's a fantasy world, and that's all that really counts about it, is that um, this all is the right thing to do by some other standard than the real world one. Um, so that's that's the deficit one. You come into it with a chip on your shoulder. But there are also surplus versions of it as well, which is that uh, uh, playing God is much easier than being human if mm -hmm. you can get away with it. And and you mentioned this a minute ago. I mean, I, I think of hypocrisy and stupidity as status symbols. Mm -hmm. I think that, that because... The rich, the monarchs, the billionaires, they can afford it. They can get away with it. So we talk about FU money, but we also it's also FU mind. You mm -hmm. don't have to care about anything you don't care about because you're completely buffered. Your money can spare you that. And so there would be a lot of aspiration to that. And if you can get away with it, that's not because you have an unusual chip on your shoulder. Like you said a minute ago, um, we all, or as as you mentioned at the beginning of this, and as I reinforced, we all have a chip on our shoulder. It's a human thing. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of people who, who do it just because they can get away with it. And so to your question of how you can tell the difference, I do think of uh, it's, it's an addiction. It's an addiction to, um, I call it myopium. It's the mm. uh, in-killing effect of myopia, of short-sightedness. That you don't have to think about consequences. It's very addictive. Uh, anybody who is weaned off of narcissism is going to look like they have a chip on their shoulder. They got they're cold turkeying off off an indulgence in uh, in uh, absolutism in in mm. hyper confidence. Um, 
So how they get into it is complicated and how you can tell when someone is in it is complicated. Also because people do it, uh, there are plenty of part-time narcissists, you know, narcissistic mm -hmm. with one person or on some topics or in some situations. They're perfectly decent people, but at night they troll like narcissists and, and it can get, and it can go to their head or not. <laughs> the, the other problem is we have to fake narcissistic tendencies to get by in the world, right? I mean, I, I go, yeah, no, it's huge. you know, yeah, I go into gaming spaces and I mean, I go on Twitch, play really hard games to make my point, and go suck it. And it is a, it is a bit of it posturing, right? It It's status, it's yeah. credibility, all this stuff, but you know, it's just one side. And then I go back and do mental health right. content. And and yeah. so I, I do have a balance with some of these streamers that do it all the time. I do watch them get lost in it. It is something that is induced. We treat this stuff like something you're born as, as some sort of um, fundamental aspect of character. But I do see reinforcing spirals going on and that is something you talk about in the article the fact that yes stepping away from that that rush of either adrenaline or or dopamine it it feels bad you know it's not just yeah, you're missing no, like something. any addiction it feels like, that's right yeah, yeah 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 and and like you said once you step away from that consequence free zone that you know, that that low self-esteem comes crashing back in on you. And if you got a function, you go back in a la la land. How right. how That's do right. people take the preliminary steps away? Because I have seen I mean, there's this big talk about, oh, you know, gaming turns people to the alt, alt right. I haven't seen that. Just some people who there are some people who just do both things. But how do people, if they're listening to this now and going, yeah, maybe I do have an unhealthy relationship with escapism versus a healthy relationship with escapism. We'll get to that in a minute. But if they think it is unhealthy, how do they start stepping down? Like, is there a nicotine patch for myopium? What a what a great question. <laughs> You're asking a great question. Um, uh, I find that most people in this situation can shed their dogma, but not their dogmatism. Ooh. That is mostly what they'll do. I, I call it, I once was lost, but now I'm blind. They'll actually shift to a different dogma, often an opposite dogma from whatever dogma they they participated in, in before. That's not weaning. That's changing drugs. Right. Um, uh, uh, and it, it is possible that if you do that enough time, you, you see the cycle. Um, another challenge in in weaning oneself off of narcissism is that as a narcissist, you will have done things that you cannot possibly justify if you don't have the master excuse. See, what I think is going on for these people is, um, uh, uh, and could go on for any of us, is self-awareness is extremely expensive. You're talking, what you just described is someone seeing their own behavior. I mm -hmm. think that we we completely underestimate the cost of self-awareness. I think of it as like waiting for a cancer diagnosis. What if I have a fatal flaw? So mm -hmm. what we tend to do is we find a external source of monitoring us. Um, it could be a god. It could be a demagogue. It could be an idea. Um, and it becomes. We say I don't have to. I don't have to monitor myself because it's monitoring me. Now, it, we can pretend that it has very strict rules that we have to follow, but those are usually yeah. just hollow rituals. It's only got one rule, which is as long as you stay loyal to it, you know, to the god or to the demagogue, then you are golden. And so once you're addicted to one of them, then you the whole of self-awareness comes crashing in back on you. Mm -hmm. And it becomes hard to find... Um, a rationale that isn't I once was lost, but now I'm blind. By now, by by blind, I mean I, I I'm no longer looking at myself, um, but I think I was lost before. 
you know, so I reject my old self. Uh, so maybe, and this would become a, a big challenge whenever there's a narcissism epidemic like what's going on, what, what's going on now, mm -hmm. because you you kind of want to welcome people into the back into the fold of humanness. Um, mm -hmm. and at the same time you've got to be monitoring because they are it's a slippery slope you know they're uh so so what kind of kindness to show and how much do you need them to admit that they were uh, uh, they were off okay jeremy i'm gonna do the annoying radio thing and tease that for coming back after the break jeremy sherman off of the Jerkology blog on Psychology Today. Also, what's up with a-holes, how to spot and stop them without becoming one. We're going to answer that question when we come back on It's Not Therapy. Stay tuned. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back in SF Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. I'm still in the interview talking to Jeremy Sherman, author of the Psychology Today Jerkology blog and the book, What's Up With A-Holes? How to Spot and Stop Them Without Becoming One. Now, before the break, we were talking about uh, how to possibly get someone to step back from narcissism, what kind of kindness to show, how to encourage that. Uh, and I did the radio teaser. Jeremy, how how likely is it that someone does recognize that they're a narcissist and, you know, wants to change their ways? Is this a common thing? Is this an uncommon thing? I find people who are weaning themselves off of narcissism kind of rare. The kind of person you describe who discovers that they've gone too far. Again, they they may reject a dogma, but they don't reject dogmatism. Mm -hmm. They apply it somewhere else. It's a but you're on to a very challenging question. Uh, people sometimes ask me since I since I describe myself as a jerkologist or a psychoproctologist, <laughs> um, uh, they ask me, "Am I an a hole? Am I a narcissist?" Mm -hmm. And I say, "If you wonder about that, chances are you're not." If you don't want to be an a-hole, expect some anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, right. And and if you have some anxiety, chances are you're not one. There are a lot of quick fix solutions. You can hear my air quotes to, yeah. you know, you're not happy. You're not getting anywhere. Do this. You don't you can do better without making any actual changes. I won't name names because people get upset. No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's a huge problem. I call it cliche Guevara, which <sighs> is that you, <laughs> that you're, you're, you're selling the same old trite solutions as if they're revolutionary and new. Yeah. And it's not that. Yeah. It's, they don't work. I have, I have a lot of trouble with the, the clinical approach to narcissism. I don't, I don't think it, I don't think it ends up addressing it very effectively. And I think that a narcissist by design is a weasel. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, I think the heart of it is a formula um, where you win no matter what. That is, mm -hmm. uh, it, it enables you, it emboldens the shy to go out there and troll. Why? Right. Why would they be emboldened? because they have a way to play heroic no matter what happens. So they're like exhibitionists. They mm -hmm. sidle up to you for conversation. And when they've got their attention, they show, they open their trench coat and show off their stiff little self-certainty. Yeah. And if you, if you leave, you're a wimp. Yep. Um, if you scold them, uh, you're, uh, you're a oppressor. Yep. Um, if you reason with them, you're, uh, um, you're a sucker. Yeah, and what? No matter what, they feel heroic. Mm -hmm. uh, they they've got you no matter what you do. So I'm very interested in um, unusual approaches, the, the surprises that they don't have a way of dealing with. One of my uh, one of my primary strategies uh, boils down to this: don't debate them. They're just masturbating to you taking the bait. Call them on that instead. That is. It's very important to, to point out, if you can, especially to an audience, this guy will say or do anything uh, to avoid feeling like a human, to mm -hmm. you know, play God. 
And mm -hmm. and the the good thing about that strategy is that no matter how they respond, they're one trick phonies. They only yeah. have that one trick. Um, and so they no matter how they respond, they'll prove your point. And I don't do that with normal with decent people, I would never say you're being defensive. That's a there's no way to respond to you right. being defensive that isn't reaffirming. But with a with a narcissist or an absolutist, whatever you want to call them, um, no, it it can be an effective strategy. And not to change their mind, but to disappoint them. Remember, I think mm. that it's easier to play God than be human if you can get away with it. So my goal is to disappoint narcissists, and it's it's very hard work. I mean, it's very complicated, challenging work. I also think it's make it or break it work for humankind. That is, if we do not figure out ways to humbly humble those people who will say or do anything to avoid human humility, we're doomed as a species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We keep, on coming. We, keep, we, keep, we keep on coming to the same challenge over and over and um, in, in diff attached to different lifestyle brands. It's got nothing to do with what lifestyle brand, communist, right wing, that, none of that yeah, matters. Yeah, exactly. It's that, all it, the same idea. It, some it's all the same feeling that, yeah, yeah. That, that humans would want because we're an anxious species. Yeah, it no matter what coat of paint it is, the structure is the same. It's some the same face, formula. Yeah, yeah, some faceless external force, patriarchy, religion, leftists yeah. you know they're there to blame for all your problems the world hates you nothing's your fault as opposed but, to you know what we yeah. know works is local community yeah exactly that's but right the issue is that these organizations train people to behave in ways that make the people around them reject them and then when they're rejected they're like see the world hates you so right and and that proves i'm heroic that's so right. It, it, yeah. yeah, that's right. So um, yeah. various lifestyle brands that claim an exclusive entitlement to use the formula I just described, which mm -hmm. is win, lose or draw, um, I, prove, I, I win and you lose. And it just, it's just incredibly satisfying. It would be most appealing to people who are not keeping up with a complicated yeah. society and, um, and also don't have that much conscience to deal with. Because right. actually, conscience is a cumber. It it's encumbering. It's it it only complicates things. You're 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 much better off if you don't have a conscience, or if you're. This is another distinction I make. A a psychopath doesn't have a conscience. A narcissist has a completely eternally reassured conscience. Right. They have their master excuse. That is, I can do anything because I'm a member of X or because I believe in X. I can now trust my gut. My gut is being monitored by X. It approves of me. I can do whatever I want. So, so it, it, whether you start out conscience-free or not, you will shed your conscience mm -hmm. if you're going to play God. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have a conscience. He doesn't have. He doesn't have cognitive dissonance. That's how we imagine him. Right. Uh, okay, so we've talked a lot about the unhealthy angle for the last bit here. How do you know your temporary escapism is healthy? Actually, you know what? Let me go to a break there. We'll just blow into the final segment of the show. Jeremy Sherman talking narcissism, how to make sure you don't become one through escapism on It's Not Therapy. Back in a bit. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back and It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kirsner. I'm still not a therapist. We are in a rare third segment of the interview. I decided to just do the rest of the show with my guest, Jeremy Sherman, author of the Jerkology blog on Psychology Today and What's Up With A-Holes, How to Spot and Stop Them Without Becoming One. And before the break, Jeremy and I were talking about how to make sure you don't slip into narcissistic behaviors through feedback loops, through our, the media we consume, through the conversations we have, through the thoughts we have. So, Jeremy, I will ask again, how do we make sure we are doing these things in a self-affirming way that is healthy? By whether you zip up after. Okay. That's all, that's all, it's, it's not how far out you go or where you go. 
It's about whether you return to reality versus thinking you've experienced something. I mean, for extra buzz, pretend that it's real. That's the danger. So imagine it this way. Imagine you went to go see a Marvel movie. And at the end, the usher comes out and he says, hey, you guys like that? And the audience says, yeah, we like that. He says, well, if you can come back and watch more on condition that I'm uh, that you go out in the world and you you claim that Iron Man is real. And uh, here's the benefit for you of doing that, which is that you get to say that you're with Iron Man. So anybody who attacks you is attacking Iron Man. Okay, so think of how easy that is. Jesus is all things great. I want to feel all things are great. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I am with Jesus. And if you attack me, you're attacking Jesus. It's that simple. So at that point, you're in danger land. When you start thinking that there's some sort of bond that requires you to act. Yeah, as if it's more real than yeah. yeah. So so and and I want to point out humans are masters of exactly the kind of healthy dealing with it that that I'm talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. I watch movies, I um lots. Uh that's how my evenings are often spent. I'm a bass player. I practice bass while watching oh, movies. Nice. Um and I'm totally in them. They're complete I'm living in them while they're on and I turn it off and I'm back to reality. Right. That's all I'm talking about. People do that with video games. They do it with masturbation. They do it with all sorts of things. We just need to learn to do that. That We need to notice how important that is for our survival. It's actually a heroic act to, re to recognize, okay, that was fun, and mm -hmm. I needed that mojo boost, and, uh, and now I'm back to reality. That's all. <laughs> Does having a balance of that sort of escapism help because i hit the point i couldn't believe it happened i was sick of samurai stuff i need something else can balancing the alternate realities help keep us grounded in reality prime right though so again that's lifestyle brand i just finished uh re-watching i think a second or third time peaky blinders okay Loved it. i just adored it um so yeah, and now I'm watching something that happens in a different era and a different culture. That's not the balance I think that matters most. What I find fundamental um, to this whole approach to life is irony. And I don't mm -hmm. mean irony as humor as much as tragic comedy. Slapstick and dire. In fact, I call it dire-ony. It's dire irony. That is, you can slip on a banana peel and die. And mm -hmm. that, so... So it's just remembering that life is iffy guesswork. And some medium forms are better at conveying that than others. So, for example, Deadpool is masterful irony. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's engaged in self-effacing irony throughout it. Whereas something, there are other forms that are, that are less simple, uh, that are more simple, you know, where the, uh, what's that one, uh, is it called Tucker? Um uh, you know, it's just a guy who can do no wrong. Right. So, he's always one step ahead, always smarter always than the antagonist. And, he, and he's yeah. gorgeous and he's a he-man and all of that sort of stuff. And I watch some of that too. But there is something about an acquired taste for irony, mm -hmm. which it's basically, it comes down to what in philosophy we call fallibilism. Fallibilism is basically comes down to if no matter how confident I am in a bet, I remain still more confident that it is a bet. That is, you recognize that life has been iffy guesswork from the get-go. It's always been iffy guesswork. The struggle for existence, it, there is no formula. And you don't get, you know, movies are written backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, life is not like that. You can make a great guess, and, and ironically, it can turn out terrible, and vice versa. You can make a terrible bet. And ironically, that's the definition of irony. Is yeah. You make a good bet that comes out bad or a bad bet that comes out good. So if that's the reality we live in, in our struggle for existence, an ironic attitude is, from my perspective, the best, you could say, inoculant against this kind of God playing, I've found the formula, I've solved reality tendency that would be strong in humans. Mm -hmm. So if we sort of reject certainty and face our mistakes, then we don't have to paper them over with fantasy. Is that what you're saying? 
That's right. And and so how does one do that? It, we're not good at just deciding to do something, being different because it would be the right way to live. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I think it comes from if if you can find friends who um, I mean, to me, the height of intimacy is laughing at and with each other. Mm hmm. Uh, OK, and that so that's that's real intimacy for me. And that means that you have to have friends who recognize that they're betting, too. And for that, it basically becomes a com community that doesn't identify as learned, but learning. And so you there's a way in which you can uh, you can stand corrected with your dignity intact. You're standing because you identify as learning. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't do that in lots of situations. There are lots of society, uh, lots of. Uh, pockets within our culture, a corporate culture that doesn't work so well. You mm -hmm. know, and you could say that this is one of the re main reasons why narcissism have narcissists have charisma. An influencer has to act as though they have solved reality. Yeah, that's um, or at least most of them do. Some don't. Some are good at this kind of ironic kind of charisma. The difference between them is fascinating, but there is a there's an that we we're still looking for the formula, even though the evidence is clear from science, there is no formula. You just get a good formula, and suddenly it stops working because things mm -hmm. change. Yep. Uh, so so standing corrected with your dignity intact is fabulous if you can pull that off. Um, I happen to live in a line of work where I get paid for noticing my own ambivalences, mm -hmm. but that's a very rare line of work. Most mm -hmm. lines of work. They want you to simply deliver on the formula. And there are formulas for plumbing. I did plumbing for a while, carpentry, mm -hmm. for carpentry, um, that, that work quite well. But overall, life isn't like that. And movies give us the false impression that it is. Because, they, you know, a summer blockbuster anyway does. Because it was written backwards. You can make the happy ending before you make all the tensions. <laughs> this is something also about humans, is that we are overwhelmed by possibilities and so we jones for habits in a way no other creature does. We are constantly trying to turn our behavior into ag algorithmic habits. So I'll make a jillion decisions today, but not consciously. Right. I'll make them by habit. So we are very busy stuffing doubts into habits. And bless our hearts. So it's a, we need to do that. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a challenge to be a human. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Sherman, PhD, author of the Jerkology blog on Psychology Today, also the Ambigamy blog on Psychology Today. I also also offer coaching services for people who are dealing with uh, someone they consider difficult company, whatever, narcissist, whatever, uh, strategic thinking about how to deal with them effectively, especially if you've been, you're, you're, you're stuck living with their decisions somehow. Um, but I, I, you, there's way too much of me online. I have a video channel and everything. So if you just Google my name, you'll find uh, way too much of me. If you go to the Jerkology blog on Psychology Today, there is a contact form if you want Jeremy's personal services. Also, his book, What's Up With A-Holes? How to Spot and Stop Them Without Becoming One. It's the uncensored title, but we can't say it on the radio. Uh, Jeremy, thanks so much. Hopefully, you listening out there found this helpful as opposed to a bunch of platitudes. That's what we do here and That's Not Therapy. Until next time, your crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you. Talk soon.